One hour of sunlight provides enough energy to power all of human activities for an entire year, right? So we can look at that and seek opportunities to harness that potential. Again, we're at that verge. Either we continue the status quo or we step forward into a future that can be a fully renewable future. My life was saved by families in our customer villages. And I feel I need to be there for our customers our current customers, our future customers, the families that we began this work with. So tonight, I think I have the privilege, and we all do, of getting to know Kathleen a little bit better. Um, and uh, I, I think where I'd like to start, I know it's a cheesy question in some ways, because you say it all the time, um, but I'd like to know the story behind One Earth Designs. Um, I mean, how long, how long have you been at this first? Well, we launched our first product in 2013, 2013 but okay. I began working with Nomads Up in the Himalayas to design this back in 2007. 2007. So it's been quite a while. Yes. So, so 10 years, and so working with Nomads in the Himalayas, mm -hmm. like let's, let's just start there. What, where did that come from? And what's your connection <laughs> to that? And, and why is that a cause you're so passionate about? Mm. So I'm a chemist by training. And I went up into the Himalayas to do a climate change research project. Mm -hmm. I was looking at coal-fired power plant deposition on the glaciers, which decreases the albedo and it causes the glaciers to melt faster. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that research, but I didn't want to stay cloistered in the research lab. So I started going out and practicing my Tibetan with the local families. <laughs> and one of the families confronted me and said, why are all you scientists coming to our region? Mm -hmm. They were not very happy about it. And I struggled to find the word for climate change in Tibetan. Mm. But it wasn't very good yet. Yeah. So I said, we're studying smoke in the sky. And the family just burst out laughing. I said, why would you do such a ridiculous thing when the sky is completely blue, but there's all this smoke inside our homes? Mm. So they pulled me into their home. We measured the air together. And we found that the air that they were breathing was 10 times more polluted than the air in Beijing. Wow. Just off the charts. Wow. I couldn't believe that people could survive in this kind of setting. Mm. So I went back started researching about this and found that four million people are dying every year because of exposure to smoke from cooking in their homes. Mm. It's one of the biggest global health challenges today. Mm. So once I learned that, yeah. I couldn't just continue my research as normal. Yeah. So I picked up, left my research lab, and started migrating with that nomadic family yeah. to see if we could design a solution together. So li literally migrating, so. Literally migrating. You, mo you moved to the steps. How, how long were you living with them? The first time was seven months, okay. and overall about seven years of wow. kind of continuous going back and forth. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. So, so before before we get to the solution, I'm I'm, I'm curious if, if we actually go back in time before that. Like, sure. wh where are you from? Originally? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother's yeah. Japanese ethnicity, my yeah. father's Irish ethnicity. Okay. I was born in the United States in yeah. Indiana, yeah. and then I grew up living some time in the U.S. and mm. some time in other countries. Mm. So in total, I've lived in six different continents yeah, over yeah. time. And so seven years yes. in the Himalayas, mm -hmm. um, you know, traveling with these nomadic communities, mm -hmm. um, what, what have you learned I, from, from that experience, from a cultural perspective, from a life oh, perspective, goodness. spiritual perspective? We'll get to the company in a moment. Right, but. right. It's actually, I feel that I have, even though I have been very fortunate to get my PhD from Harvard and get a lot of education in my life. The most important lessons have come from that time living with mm. the nomads. I helped them build a solar powered stove and they helped me learn the love and trust and friendship that you can have from relying on each other for day to day survival. Mm. And that's something I feel I can never repay. So I mm. wake up every day thinking about how I can pay it forward. Mm. And that's part of the drive behind our company. Mm, that's in essence what you're doing. Mm. And so, so solar powered cook stoves, yes. right? Um, if, if, you, if you look at that space, in, in many ways it's a graveyard, mm, right? Absolutely. Uh, there, there are so many technological plays that have gone out and they make a lot of sense in the lab and mm. they make no sense in the market. Mm, mm. Um, I, how, how is what One Earth Design is doing? How is it different? Great question. And to answer that, I think I'll go back a little bit in yeah. history as well. So. When I first started working with the nomads, I thought the way to solve this was to improve the traditional stoves. So we were adding chimneys, improving the combustion chambers, and we were getting nowhere. Mm. Because families migrated seven times per year, moved locations, and every time the women had to build a new stove. Mm. And every time the men had to wait an extra half day for hot food when we added a chimney. 
So the men were not having this at all. <laughs> so I became quite frustrated. I called a village meeting and was asking the elders, so how do we solve this? How do we actually make progress? One of the elders said, you know, the only way that we're going to find a real solution is if we address fuel as well. Mm. Because every year, our women are walking further and further to get to the forest, mm. to get fuel wood. Yeah. So you know, he, he thought back in his time about an experience that he had had that had showed him a different way. And he said, several years ago, the government gave me a solar cooker. They dropped it off by the side of the road, and my wife walked 18 kilometers down to the road to get it. When she got there, she found a 95 kilogram slam of concrete with mirrors pasted on top, and that was their solar cooker. So it was a terrible experience for them to try to bring this 95 kilogram thing back to their home. Now once they got it there, they set it up. It performed beautifully. It was saving them so much fuel. But then three months later, the weather changed, the concrete fractured, and the entire thing fell apart. So he said, this showed us the power that the sun can have, but we need technologies that aren't only powerful, but also durable and portable and safe for us to use. So I took that as a challenge. And at first, I went out and looked at all the different solar cookers that were out there. We ordered a bunch. We tested them out. Nothing worked because it's tremendously cold up in the Himalayas and tremendously windy, and we have lots of sandstorms. So those three pretty much made everything not viable. So then I went to the local factories and got a bunch of scrap material, brought it to the village. We made a pile in the center of the village, and people started to prototype on their own. So we had many different villagers prototyping, testing them out, and my job became going around and collecting the best practices and then making master prototypes from there. So it was a really beautiful collective design process that we ended up going through. Uh, mm. How many prototypes have you been through? Would you say? Around 58. 58, yes. So. Yeah. yeah, so you, your original question was what makes us different? Yeah. And I talked about the process that we use to get yeah. there. But now, the things that make us most different are, mm. one, none of the reflectors that have been on the market up until now have performed at the level that our customers need. Mm. So we ended up developing a new reflector system that's 92% energy efficient and self-healing. So what that means is that we can provide the power that our customers require for their cooking in a much smaller space. Mm. And when we go through big sandstorms, even if the reflector gets scratched, the van der Waals forces push it back together so that we don't have optical, we end up having not a reduction in efficiency because the optics aren't affected. So those are two big breakthroughs in the space. The other aspect is the design itself. Previously, women were leaning into the front of their solar stoves to try to cook and getting a bunch of UV radiation in their faces. Tremendously uncomfortable, tremendously unsafe. So we designed a user interface and a new adjustment system, several different design changes that made it much more comfortable and convenient for people to cook with the sun. Hmm. Hmm. And so 57 or 58 prototypes 58. to get here? So 58 yes. prototypes. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're in a space where most companies have, have failed. Mm. You've been at this for a decade. Mm. Um, h- how do you, what, what motivates you to persist through all the challenges, all the lessons learned, you know, all of the different prototypes? I touched on it before, yeah. saying that I felt motivated to pay it forward because mm. of the learnings that I've had. Even more deeply driving that desire to pay it forward has been that I've had several circumstances where my life was saved Mm -hmm. by families in our customer villages. Mm -hmm. And again, that creates a sense of really not being able to to abandon the work Mm -hmm. that we do. I feel I need to be there for our Mm -hmm. customers, our current customers, our future customers, the families that we began this work with. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many stories. Mm -hmm in you know, 10 years of doing this work. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think oftentimes, 10 years later, you have the most efficient solar concentrator on the planet, mm-hmm. right? Um, we can look at all these successes um, and say, wow, that's, that's amazing, but uh, not to acknowledge that it's still hard. So, so what, what is hardest about your work now, 10 years into it? So the biggest challenge we face is, well, there are lots of challenges, but the biggest one is that we would like to be able to have more rapid R&D cycles to improve our products for our customers. And that's quite challenging to finance via an emerging market business model. Mm. So we've actually differentiated our business model now to have both emerging market and developed market segments so that we can get the profit margins that allow us to drive good R&D and improve our products. 
like that, so it would move faster. So I, I, th I think we're actually getting close to time, mm -hmm. which is horrible because I don't know about you all, but I could spend hours mm -hmm. talking with you, Catley. But um, I mean, how, how do we... Actually, actually, before I get to the last question, um, you know, success, success and failure, right? Mm. This uh, realizing its potential or not mm. is it, often um, closer to the edge than, than we think. Mm. Um, you know, how, how do we ensure, mm. as a community, anybody who's tuning in right now, but here, th this community, how, how do we ensure that this, you know, fully sees the light of day and realizes its potential? How, how can we help you um, mm. get this there? That's a great question. Uh, well, I think learning more about the potential of renewable energy mm. and the sun specifically. Right now, we live in a world where we're, we're, we're faced with some different, difficult choices. Right? We can choose to continue the status quo and bear the potentially very secure, uh, severe consequences that might come along with it. Or we can choose to look at the options that are available to us, mm. see that some of the renewable resources that are in abundance, like the sun, which can actually, one hour of sunlight provides enough energy to power all of human activities for an entire year, mm. right? So we can look at that and, under, and, and seek opportunities to harness that potential. Mm. So I think, again, we're at that verge. Mm. Either we continue the status quo or we step forward into a future that can be a fully renewable future. Hmm. And there aren't that many options for a middle ground. Yeah. So. Mm. La last question. Yes. If you if you could go back to yourself mm -hmm. ten years ago, mm -hmm. um, when I you, you first first went out into the Himalayas, I had you were working on something completely different. What what do you wish you had known then that you know now? What would you have told yourself ten years ago? <gasps> Oh, I wish I knew about product development, shipping, <laughs> uh, marketing, <laughs> I, pretty much everything. Yeah. I was very much focused on science when mm. I began. And I was a very good chemist, but mm. I was not a very good business person. Yeah. So I've learned pretty much everything on the business and product side from being on the job. And it's been a tremendous experience, but things would have moved a lot faster if I had had some of that knowledge previously. Yeah. Uh, including understanding how to hire people who are great in those areas. Mm. Sometimes if you don't understand it yourself, it can be a challenge to hire the real stars. Mm. So that's certainly something that I would do differently if I could go back. Mm. Uh, Khaled, I wish, I wish we had hours. The, mm. the good news is we have a couple weeks yes. um, beyond this. So I think we'll just conclude this with a huge round of applause and thank you so much.